Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to tell you a story of how high-tech meets low-tech, of how a bunch of aspiring roboticists from Singapore meets 21st century farmers from Southeast Asia, with the hope that it will change your idea on the role of drones in putting food on your table. Three years ago, we started Singapore-based startup Garuda Robotics to help businesses solve problems using aerial imaging and software analytics using drones, or unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV. We assembled a bunch of technology that was available to us at the time, illustrated our dreams on PowerPoint slides, and went knocking on doors uh, on businesses that could potentially uh, benefit from the aerial data collection. So it wasn't long before we met a group of investors and managers of palm oil plantations. Now, most of us grew up in the city, right? So even though we have seen them all along the expressways, we have no idea what was installed for us. But still, we put together a plan, figured out some of the fancy new aerial imaging technology as applied to agriculture, and we went to see them in their plantation. Now, why palm oil? Let me first motivate you on why we decided that getting ourselves into palm oil delivers a big impact, not just to Singapore, but also to the Southeast Asian economy. You see, Singapore's neighbors, Malaysia and Indonesia, collectively produce 85% of the world's palm oil. It is the most land-efficient bio-renewable energy in the world, yielding 10 times more oil than the world's number two bio-renewable energy soybean. And it's also extremely useful. You can find it in like, uh, lipstick, ice cream, shampoo, chocolate, uh, biodiesel, package break, detergent, and so on. So, if, because it's such a useful plan, it should be a surprise that negative sentiments tend to dominate the mainstream media, right? So, for example, uh, this should be a very familiar scene to everybody, right? This is Singapore during the hay season. The blame is often put in the regional palm oil industry, even though every other conglomerate have vowed to tackle this issue of slash and burn agriculture. Uh, there's also the issue of migrant workers, uh, because it's a, still a very labor-intensive industry. The introduction of foreign minimum wage workers affects local communities both socially and economically. Also often heard are how pollutants from these plantations run off into the rivers and polluting the waters. Uncontrolled issuing of new plantation land often means deforestation and the destruction of habitat for wild animals like orangutan. So to promote sustainable planting practices, the palm oil industry itself created a certification body called RSPO, or the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, to govern itself. It promotes sustainable practices as well as carry out audits to ensure the compliance. So one such founding member, IOI Plantations, uh, failed its own stringent rules last April and was immediately removed as a supplier from major palm oil buyers like Nestle, Colgate Palmolive, uh, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Hershey's, uh, Johnson Johnson, Kellogg's, Mars, etc. Fortunately, they took immediate actions to address their failures, and, and was, the suspension was lifted in August, but not without strong protests from the NGOs. So it seems like everyone wants to know what's actually happening in the plantations, right? The public wants to find out more about how to make better decisions, right? The, the NGOs want to find out what is what all the, all the illegal activities and expose them to the media. The governments might want to track the, the larger things like coastlines, forest borders, and plan interventions or infrastructure projects that will benefit the local farmers. But most importantly, the plantations HQ, typically in Singapore, KL, or Jakarta, wants data of the millions of acres of plantation that they have to uh, responsible, be responsible for every single day. Okay, so let's come back to our story. So there we were with a bunch of plantation managers, right, uh, with these cool new visualizations and algorithms that we thought would just blow them away. We demonstrated them drones, uh, geography, physics. We demonstrated how we connect field devices to the internet. We show them geography information systems and mapping and so on. So they simply just nodded. Right. Finally, it's their turn to ask questions. In their authentic suburban Malaysian Chinese accent, they went, <laughs> So 
they, they're not saying that, you know, they're not challenging our ability on math, right? They're asking us, do you guys know how to count trees? Suan Su. <laughs> right? So as it turns out, that, that is the problem that they have. It's the simplest problem and it's also the hardest problem. They need an accurate count of the trees. Surely there's some count that's being done when the saplings left the nursery and then another census done after it was planted. Maybe some of the saplings died. But here's the problem. A palm tree is a 25-year crop. It doesn't bear fruit for the first three years, and it will peak in production in nine to 12 years, and it will continue to be productive into its 20s, unless it's too sick, too tall, too old, then you cut it down for replanting. During this long period of time, some might have already died due to land erosion, disease, flooding, or theft. And other times, new trees are planted in its place. Under the current best practices, each of these three will require a predetermined amount of fertilizers as measured by this little bowl here. This is very important because, labor aside, 60 to 70% of the total running cost of a plantation is, to be, is buying fertilizers and pesticides. Thus, plantation managers will need to calculate the exact amount of fertilizers to purchase for each tree or each block based on the number of trees. If they overestimate the number of trees, some of the trees will not get the fertilizers for them to maximize their productivity. If they underestimate the number of trees, these minimal wage workers are more likely to just dis you know, disseminate the extra fertilizers rather than lug them back all the way to storage. Excessive fertilizers that does not get absorbed by the palm trees will run off with the uh, torrential rain water and go into the rivers. So this will destroy the environment and it also hurts the bottom line for the plantations. Because of their sheer size, these plantation managers cannot walk and check the entire plantation every day. Some of them will venture to buy expensive satellite imagery like this one, but our Southeast Asian skies are full of clouds, and it's always blocking their visibility. Now, this is where drones come into the picture. They fly very close to ground, and thus is able to take very high resolution picture of the plants without cloud cover or even thick haze to penetrate, right? So let's go and count some trees together, right? <laughs> so first we have to pick a drone. Which drone shall we pick? We have uh, fixed wing drones, which are like little mini aeroplanes. We have multi-rotor drones. We have helicopters and airships. Now multi-rotor drones are the most agile of them. Okay? They can take off and land vertically in a very dense plantation and hover in place. But in this case, we have no need to hover in place. Like what we would do, say, in Singapore when we are inspecting a building facade or inspecting solar panels on a roof. So let's pick a fixed wing drone. Its aerodynamic design allows for a much longer distance given the same amount of power. Right? Okay, next. How do we control a drone? For most of the consumer drones you are familiar with, like those you see maybe during events or outdoor weddings, uh, you will pilot them with this handheld dual stick transmitter. These remote control devices work through radio frequencies, much like how your phone talks to a Wi Fi AP. However, there are legal and technical limits to how much power you can pump through these devices. So at some point in time, you are going to lose the ability to pilot by stick. So in this situation, we will have to count on the computer on the drone to fly itself. Here's a popular survey grid pattern. Yeah, this pattern, uh, which you can plan using, say, a ground control software, and you can upload it to the drone's brain before flight. The drone will then fly itself autonomously, guided by onboard GPS sensors, and take a picture every few seconds. And with enough overlap, these pictures can then be stitched together into one gigantic map like this. Right? Okay, we're done. So, are you ready? How many trees are there in this picture? How many? 50? How about this one? It gets harder, right? How about this one? You, you, know what's, you know what's strange? This is actually done. I, I'm not, this is not a theoretical exercise. This is actually done today by human counters. Okay? In fact, in a real typical counting operation, one guy will count, and another guy will have to check whether the first guy counted correctly. Okay? It's actually manual, isn't it? This is where computer vision comes in. There are many, many applications for computer vision in the drone industry. 
In Singapore, we typically deploy it for security and surveillance purposes, putting an eye in the sky and helping to reduce the amount of walking that security guards need to do uh, to patrol a large compound. But uh, there are similar needs in the plantation, right, for uh, tracking unauthorized vehicles, for example. But more importantly, you can detect the dead trees or brown leaves um, so that uh, uh, rebuild actions can be taken. So that's it. Counting healthy trees are uh, still, still a tough nut to crack. This is especially the case for trees that are greater than five years old, where the fronds start to touch each other one and crisscross one another, making it hard to decide when it starts and stops. So this means even though you can deliver, say, a 95% accuracy using computer vision, we will still need the manual count to clean up to get the accurate count for the plantation manager. Tree counting is but one of the many reports we generate for agricultural customers on a periodic basis. This one is a DSM, or Digital Surface Model, which is basically a 3D reconstructed model of a plantation with all the tree canopy. The same technology is deployed in Singapore to reconstruct the 3D version of the city all visible surface. This is a DTM, or Digital Terrain Model, which what you do is you digitally chop off all the trees in the DSM to reveal the ground level. This is very important for civil works in the plantation, to build roads, to build bridges, and most importantly, to build drains, so that you can drain away the torrential rainwater, much like how a canal in Singapore does. The same base model is also used to redesign uh, roads to minimize the distance between the tree and the collection point, and this will help increase the productivity even with manual labor. We also shoot infrared cam with infrared cameras and calculate various indices like uh, for biomass or photosynthesis levels, as well as perform some of the fertilizer spraying operations for some kinds of crops like uh, rice. All right, now, with the upcoming proliferation of drones in the plantation, wouldn't it be great if we, the consumer, gets to see exactly what's happening and get access to all this aerial data as well? We can use that data to make a very informed decision right, on what goods that we can purchase, whether the goods came from sustainable sources or not. Well, this road to uh, uh, this, this, this future is going to be a very long one. Okay? And if you ask me, it will have to start from these plantation managers first. To see why, let me bring you through how some of these agriculture MNCs work. Okay, you see, uh, most of them owns a large chunk of the supply chain. Okay? They start from the mills, who turns the palm fruit into crude palm oil or crude kernel palm oil, all the way down to the factories, uh, including some of them in, in Singapore, right? Uh, that turns them into further downstream products. To reduce the business risk and tie up capital, most of these plantation MNCs won't own all the land and all the palm trees that feed into their supply chain a huge proportion of their inputs comes from these smaller plantation holders who don't have mills and certainly have no access to advanced technology as they have. They sign up with the MNC to become a contract farmer. So these nameless locals, not, not these guys, huh, <laughs> are often the culprits when it comes to employing traditional methods in land clearing and planting. Not because they don't know any better, but because they don't have the economic reason to do better. This is why I feel drones will become the future de facto way relationships are managed between the downstream and the upstream. Because every buyer would want to see and want to work with transparent and responsible farmers so that they can claim that all their oil comes from sustainable sources. Therefore, although these plantation managers are using drones to raise productivity, uh, cut down manpower, maybe reduce risk today in their own plantation. I think we are just warming up to a totally new future where we all can see where our food comes from. Right? So today, um, I'll end up today with, by sharing with you my dream, and hopefully some of you uh, can make this a reality. Imagine walking, uh, walking into NTUC Fairprice, okay, and going to the wine section and picking up a bottle of wine. Through your, maybe, I don't know, intelligent glass, then, right? You can immediately see the vineyard where this wine came from, and zoom in to see the color of the grape 
when it was harvested, which determines the exact ripeness, which is critical to the wine production quality. Similarly, you could maybe walk into, uh, and maybe you can find out the exact sector of palm trees, where, uh, maybe from Sumatra, right? Where, where the palm fruit is milled and made into the conditioning agent of your shampoo that you just picked up. Knowing very well that all of them are professionally and ethically and sustainably planted and harvested. And finally, you could, you could uh, maybe scan the label of this, the identification label of this delicious looking Mao San Wang durian. Okay, and find in a map, in Bentong, Pahang, where it comes from, and maybe even know the time it was picked up so you can determine its freshness. Wouldn't this be the kind of future we want to build together? Thank you very much. <laughs>